Hi, and welcome. I'm Ruth McCambridge. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Nonprofit Quarterly, and I have Cecilia Conrad with me today. I'm going to take a minute to talk to you about what exactly we're doing here, and, um, and then I'm going to um, introduce Cecilia more in depth. Um, what we are attempting to do here, and it really actually is as a result of a conversation between um, the MacArthur Foundation and us about trying to understand what goes on behind the curtain in the philanthropic uh, arena, is to try to kind of expose what it is that people are thinking underneath the grant types that they're making. Um, the MacArthur Foundation has always been highly experimental in their grant making. It's where they started. It's where they, all, they are still. Um, but they also tend to make some fairly large commitments um, over time to things that, um, that I think not every foundation is, is really committed to, like world peace, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, nuclear disarmament, those kinds of small things. Um, in any case, what this first what this first session is is the first of of an experiment um, that NPQ is thinking about running in, in um, presenting a foundation staff and leaders to explain why they are making the types of grants they are making and what their processes are, what their thinking is, what their interaction with grantees and other people is around making those grants. Um, so we welcome you to this first um, session and we ask you please to um, make it, make whatever comments uh, and, and pose whatever questions that you like, but probably wait until after we've gotten through the majority of our discussion here before you do that. So welcome Cecilia. Thank you. Cecilia is the managing director of the uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, which is a very large foundation, fifth largest, is that? True. You know, I think we might have slipped a little, but oh, certainly okay. in the top ten. <laughs> there but, are, there's new foundations being born. It's, it's um, got over six billion dollars in assets. It gives out around two hundred and fifty million a year yes. in its grant making. Um, so it's definitely a larger size foundation. It's based in Chicago, um, and as I said, it's it's been relatively high profile in its its experimentation in its grant making over the years. And so what we're going to hear about today is as a new program, um, which is one of their big bets. And but it's an extraordinary big bet. So I'm going to um, it basically what it is, is it's uh, the foundation offered to um, provide a hundred million dollar grant to an organization who could make a good case for how they would um, solve a problem having to do with people, places, or things, right, basically. Right, right. Um, and uh, so that, that, that uh, I think the process for vetting those applications has been pretty intensive. It's yes. taken a while. Um, but it's not the only big bet that um, MacArthur makes. MacArthur also makes a number of other big bets. And I think Cecilia today will tell us not only about this $100,000 competition, but also about some of the other big bets as a context for how it's approaching this type of grant making. Yes. So welcome, Cecilia. Thank you. And um, maybe I'll, we'll start just a little bit with just a general description of how the foundation generally makes grants, um, and then leading into some of the big bets that it has already in yes. Yes. process. So um, the foundation has historically made grants in really many different areas, but about three or four years ago, we decided to narrow our focus uh, to focus resources, most of our resources on a smaller number of problems with the hopes of achieving real impact. And we've divided those problems into what we call our big bets. And, and it's funny, we actually don't call 100 and change a big bet. I'll explain why in a minute. <laughs> uh, but we have what we call our big bets. Um, and as you've mentioned, it has to do with nuclear security, 
Uh, we're working in criminal justice on reducing incarceration rates. Um, we have a, a big bet in terms of looking at impact investing. Uh, we have work in Nigeria, which is a place that MacArthur has been engaged for a long time that's focused on corruption. And we have our climate solutions, which is focused on U.S., India, and China leadership. Um, and so small problems. Small problems. <laughs> and the idea with those is that it kind of falls under the way I think we've historically done grant making. We have uh, staff members who have deep expertise in those fields, and they go out and they engage with others in the fields. And from that, they develop a strategy, a notion about how we can go about making change or making improvements towards this particular issue area. And then they go and match up the strategy with the organizations that are doing work that fits within that strategy, and grants are made on that basis. We also have what we call our enduring commitments, and there are two of those. One is to the city of Chicago, our hometown, and the other is to uh, journalism and media, which we really think of as under the umbrella of American democracy. And in those cases, they are um, less, uh, they're not as time limit, they're not focused on a specific problem, but they're more in terms of building that field, that infrastructure, and doing what we think is needed. So those are our big areas of work. But when we restructured to focus on a smaller number of things um, and uh, exited a number of fields where the foundation had been involved in the past, we decided that we should have some space where we could be open because we recognized that those other fields were all fields that we had picked and we were defining the strategy, although with outside consultation. So the notion behind 100 and Change was to have, and why we don't call it a big bet is that we didn't define the problem and we didn't define the strategy. Mm -hmm. We sort of asked for the world to tell us, what can $100 million do? Right. Yeah, it's, uh, so can you talk a little bit about the uh, the um, thinking that went into how to approach this new endeavor? Because that's a fairly significant shift from you defining what the problem should be to your be uh, kind of opening the doors to hear from people what the where the opportunities are basically. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, some people thought we were crazy. And maybe, maybe we were. <laughs> we, we, we started trying to think about how to do this. And there were a couple of decision points. The first was we had, we wanted to be open about the problem. And so one approach might have been to do some big call about what problem should we work on? And one could imagine, you know, just a crowd-based thing where we had post problems on a Facebook page and have people vote. And there, you know, there are various ways we could have just gone out and asked for the problems that are the most important to people. And, uh, and, and then separate that from a process of then identifying the solution. So one could imagine that as a two-part process. Mm -hmm. And we thought about doing that. Our big concern was that we didn't know that the problem would necessarily, the problems that might come out would necessarily match with the notion that we had that there were some problems where a focused amount of significant resources, $100 million, in a compact period of time could really make significant headway. And so we thought there might be a disconnect between the two things. And so we decided to bundle them together and say, you have to tell us the problem and the solution and explain how the solution is got strong, has strong evidence behind it. You have to tell us how it's going to be sustained after the $100 million is gone. And so we decided to constrain the problem set by putting pr criteria in place that we thought were agnostic. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of criteria was that? So we, we had four. Uh, the first was meaningful. And, and there, you know, it's kind of a subjective. We were asking our, our panel of judges to, to assess how important a problem is this. Is the solution that's being proposed really going to have a meaningful impact mm -hmm. on, on the problem? The second was uh, what we called verifiable, and there we wanted persuasive evidence that the solution, if you implemented it, would have the impact you described, that it mm -hmm. would work, that it would do what you were saying it was going to do. And, 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 and that turned out to be kind of a significant hurdle. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. because there, there are lots of, of good ideas out there that still really need some testing. Right. Um, and then the, sec the third thing was feasible, which was really asking do you have a plan for how to do it? So a lot of times people may have a really good idea about a solution, 
but no kind of map to get there, no notion of what they need in terms of an organization to get there. Um, and then also, we wanted some notion that people had thought through obstacles they might encounter. And they don't necessarily need to have figured out how they're going to remove all of them, but we wanted to see that they had thought it through. Right. Okay. And then the last was durable. And this was another kind of significant hurdle. We wanted the solution to last past the grant. And when we asked for durable, we imagined three different ways. One is that it could be that it's almost like a magic pill, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you take this and your problem is solved and you'll never have to take another pill again. Um, and then we had the notion that if you had a big investment in some infrastructure or other things, there might be an identifiable stream of revenue that would sustain the solution over the long term. Mm -hmm. It could come from the market, it could come from the government, it could come from general philanthropy mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and then the last is that maybe that if our $100 million might allow you to demonstrate something that would persuade money to move <laughs> to this particular solution process, what we call unlock the resources. Mm -hmm. So what, what kinds of, uh, you must have noticed that there would be blocks of types of fields that were yes. particularly attracted to this, this competition. So what did you notice in terms of the types of fields, um, the types of problems that were being? Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I've been thinking a lot about the fields because I'm not sure they aligned with necessarily what I expected. And... Um, for all of you, I hope you know, we have a database online uh, at our website that allows you to go and look, and you can go through the fields and see what, what we have in, in terms of the submissions that we got. We, we, we got a much larger number in what I would call medicine translational research mm -hmm. than I expected, uh, partly because I didn't think $100 million was enough money for, for those kinds of projects going mm -hmm. in. But it turns out there are some that $100 million could let them move. So what kinds? Clinical you... trials for okay. drugs and for treatments. So we got many more of those than I had expected. In retrospect, you know, it's 2020 hindsight, um, I recognized that, first of all, there are a really strong sense of what evidence looks like. So they could be very persuasive in that regard. I think there also um, have applications waiting. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, just sitting on the shelf. So they had a leg up. They had a leg up, I think, <laughs> um, and 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 strong applications waiting, mm -hmm. and compelling applications mm -hmm. waiting. So I think that's one reason why we ended up with with a number of them, particularly that ended up scoring well in our top two hundred. And it's partly a consequence of in that first go round, we had kind of a short launch pad. Mm -hmm. You know, we announced in June two thousand sixteen, the applications were due October two thousand sixteen. And so that would certainly help the people who kind of already had an application sure. sitting. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So other fields that really yeah. showed up there? Um, we, we've had a number of fields having to do with um, what I will call, um, ooh, let me think about this for a little bit because I'm thinking of different ones. So we got quite a few in the energy field. Many of that them really lent themselves to potentially impact investments. Mm -hmm. And so we actually handed a lot of them over to our impact investment group to take a look at and to think about in that space. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly a lot of off-grid energy kinds of, yeah. of solutions that I found very, very exciting. Where we got less was in what I would call sort of local social problems. Um, and I think there, there was a real problem with the durability that mm -hmm. you know, many of these problems, many of the solutions that people were proposing clearly require ongoing philanthropic support, mm -hmm. and it wasn't necessarily clear where that would come from, uh, even though they were very, very compelling kinds yeah. of projects. Um, there are more, we got many proposals, many more proposals for work outside of the U.S. than inside of the U.S., um, and the, um, particularly in Africa and Latin America. That's interesting. Yeah. Why do you think that's so? I have theories. <laughs> One theory is that it turns out that $100 million buys you a lot more yeah. <laughs> in some of those places, I mean, in terms of, of what it costs to do certain things. So I mm -hmm. think there's a, a, an element of that. I think the, the other piece of it is that there are just compelling and really important problems that we actually have some notion about how to address that have been sitting waiting for right. the opportunity to scale. 
And so people were ready to come forward with, you know, we tried this here, and now we want to roll it out to the rest of the country, or maybe we want to replicate it in some other countries and, and repeat it. So there are a number of those kinds of projects. Yeah. So maybe we can go now, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe we can go now and just talk about um, what's the, what was the process and the timeline for this? Um, did you change that along the way? Um, were there any adjustments that you had to make along the way? We had to make a few small adjustments, but we, we announced in June 2016 and our submission deadline was October 2016. And uh, the hope was that in December of 2016, we would uh, identify the semifinalists. Uh, we ended up not identifying the semifinalists, I think, until February of right. 2017. <laughs> and, and that really kind of reflected the response that we got, this pool of applications. How many applications did you get? I believe it was 1,904, give or take, <laughs> that we got total. Uh, we had an administrative review process internally, but 1904 was not what I was thinking we were going to get. So, so there was a, a lengthier stage of actually having people read through all 1904. And uh, 800 of them went to our panel of judges, and I, our judges were just remarkable. <laughs> each one of them read it. Most of them read at least 10, some read 20. Um, each, each application was read by five judges. And the judges wrote comments. They were required to give substantive feedback mm -hmm. to the proposals, which then went out to all of those who were read by judges. And But we had this pool that the board could then look at of the highest scoring proposals, and they were, they were, they were good. And so it took a while for the board to actually go through and narrow right. the field. Right. So what now, you've, you've narrowed it down to four. Yes. And... Um, where are you going from here? How? Well, okay. What does the end of the process look yeah. like? Yeah. So in December, the four finalists uh, will be really showcased at an event, and the event has a couple of pur several purposes. One is that we're hoping to continue to inspire people to think about focusing on solving problems. And when I say people, I'm not just talking about getting organizations to think big, but we really hope we can get other donors to think about the possibility that there should be some space for really focusing big resources on a problem. And, and so we're hoping we're going to inspire people, and we have a live stream, and we're hoping to have people engaged there. The, um, we also are going to have people in the room that mm -hmm. we're hoping might get engaged in some of the projects. Unfortunately, we have one $100 million grant, and these are four excellent projects, um, and so the hope is that we'll find other funders who might, over time, get interested and engaged in these other projects. And um, so, so there's the showcase there, and then our board will also have an opportunity to engage more deeply with each team uh, in person and to have conversations right. and to learn more about the projects. So they'll be making a decision shortly right. thereafter. Um, we have been working with the eight semifinalists since we picked them last February. We engaged um, some experts who helped them with sustainability, with providing, helping them really build out plans. And the plans are, uh, there's just so much more detail than when we first had those applications. Mm -hmm. So that's been a great experience. And we had them doing other things over the summer as well, which I can tell you more about it if you'd like yeah. to know. But Yeah, really interesting. So I want to just divert for a second here. And um, I actually talked to a lot of people before I came into this session, and I'm like, what questions do you want me to ask Cecilia? Um, and they really were probably what you have heard as critiques. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to let you talk about what those critiques have been and where they've come from and what you're thinking about those critiques. So, um, so one of the critiques that I've heard, um, and I, I heard this from various spaces. I've heard it from judges in the competition. I have um, heard it from others, you know, who are just generally in the philanthropic space. Um, most recently, I heard it on the, I heard it expressed in the BBC sort of radio documentary that was done. And this is the question about whether or not a single grant of $100 million to a single project is the right thing to do, or wouldn't it be more fair to break it up into smaller grants and to give more of them. And I understand where that's, that's coming from because our, our natural notion of fair is, is that notion. But I think that what it misses is, is a couple things. First of all, 
I don't think any of us would argue that every grant should be of this size or this magnitude. As I mentioned earlier, there were clearly submissions we got that would benefit from some smaller grants to build up a proof of concept and so on. So I think there's a real argument for product diversity. With that said, this is a space that isn't, that isn't there in the product diversity space. And so it's, there's this belief that we have, and I think the examples that we have as semifinalists kind of bear this out, that there are some problems out there that instead of just kind of like treating them over time, but you just live with it and you continue to treat it by incremental amounts of funds, that if you really focused your resources, attention, and excitement over a smaller period, you might actually be able to lick it. And that is the premise behind mm -hmm. this. So it is, is what argues against breaking up this large grant into smaller amounts. I think there will be a question that we'll ask ourselves is whether this was the right price point. Um, whether there's other price points we should think about. Are there other categories right. uh, of grants that we might think about over time? And that's certainly something we'll ask ourselves. But, but that's, that's one mm -hmm. big criticism that I've heard. Um, the other is a more generic criticism of competitions. And it's one we've really taken to heart and we're going to really be examining after the fact. And that is that it imposes a burden on the participants because you invest time, and sometimes even resources right. because you bring on consultants to do an application and it has a kind of quality of a moonshot because there were 1,904 and in the end we only have one $100 million grant. Right. And we've been conscious of that all along. We designed the initial application we hoped not to be too burdensome in that regard. It had to be a certain amount of burdensome because it was $100 million that we needed to get collect information for. Uh, but we try to, we've, we've investigated now, we've figured out how much time people reported spending. It seems like it took roughly 40 to 60 hours to do it. Um, and so that's now, really, uh, I mean, that's surprising to me. 40 to 60 hours is not much time. For, no, I didn't have that reaction, but we're still going to ask ourselves, did we use everything we asked people for? Like, yeah. is it, is it, are there things we could have done later to mm -hmm. like make it less of a, of a burden? Mm -hmm. Um, we are, um, so that's one point. Then we hoped that we would give value added in terms of giving feedback. One of the things that was disturbing is that we had a, a pretty high number eliminated during administrative review, which means they didn't get judges' feedback. We tried to give feedback to them from staff, right. but one of the things we'll be thinking about is can we structure some kind of self audit to save those projects? from really investing a lot of time right, when they weren't right, a right fit right. for 100 and change. And yeah. that's something we'll work on too. Um, and, and then for the groups who have made it this far, they've had even more of an investment in resources and time and people. And we have provided in-kind support in forms of technical assistance. Our communications team has been working with them. We are trying to like get them out in front of other donors. And, and actually, we've done that with all 1,900. We're working on some partnerships to uh, make those accessible and of uh, and available to other donors and to try and actually steer people. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you're interested in this? I got this. Let me show you where it is right. in our, our pile. Because uh, we're trying to create some value added to offset the fact that there is a burden mm -hmm. imposed on those who participate. Right. Okay. So that's actually most of the most of the critiques that I've heard is, you know, how many people's time can you waste on something like this mm -hmm. that benefits only one group? Does it really benefit only the one group? Yeah. Um, is it, you know, is is the ROI on it at all reasonable yeah. for all of these poor nonprofits who yeah. are like? You're, you're their lottery, right. you know, you're their lottery fantasy, right. and they've already thought about what, you know, what they're going to do with that lottery money. That's right. I have, um, I have heard some really wonderful stories. You provide mental health <laughs> I <know>. support after. <laughs> I think I'm going to mental health support. I've heard wonderful stories from organizations who have reported back that the process of thinking about the application was helpful to them. I recognize, though, that there's a filter there, right? That that exactly. I'm not sure yeah. I'm going to hear from those who felt like, oh, this was a waste of time. Right. Um, the I, we're hoping that through the surveying that we're doing with our independent evaluator, we'll collect those. But what some organizations have said is that that it really some, including some who didn't apply, who put time in an application. I just talked to somebody the other day who showed me his draft application, and he said they got so far, and then they realized that no, they weren't ready. 
uh, but that it forced them to kind of really think where would we go if we had more resources? What would it be to look right. bigger? And um, in one case, one of the university campuses, they had an internal competition mm -hmm. for 100 and change to what they were going to submit. They didn't have to, they could have submitted more than one, but um, the result of it was that there were two parts of campus who were working on a very similar project and they didn't know it. Mm. And when they both submitted, mm -hmm. the university brought them together. And so they actually have a new collaborative project that's emerging between the School of Social Science and the engineering school. So so there, there are some great examples of things that evolved, be, that emerged because of this. Right. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, okay, so uh, you've described the that shift, um, which I think is very important between your setting an agenda and their setting an agenda. Can you talk a little bit more about what that does to the culture of the organization of of your organization? I mean, what que a larger questions has that brought up? What are you exploring in all of that? Yeah, it, it. I think it's that's a really fascinating line to think through. And and I should preface what I'm about to say is that, you know, I'm I've been in at MacArthur for five years now. Um, it's kind of hard to believe it's been five years, but I initially came to run the MacArthur Fellows Program, which is kind of its own little special right. section. And and then I took on this 100 and change. And and I think it's important to know that my framing of. So I'm I'm sort of in a way a little bit of an outsider inside. Um, both because of the fellows program and now um, because of 100 and change and and I think there are multiple kinds of things that are at play one is that um, even though we are a, a, a big foundation and a well-off foundation there's still a fixed amount of resources mm -hmm. and so there's always a little tension of are you are you diverting resources that would really help on my end and in, in, in my kind of problem area and and I think what's what makes that more important is it is particularly important is that this 100 and change process be one that's rigorous that engages all parts of the foundation about a bit in it so that people feel comfortable that what we end up doing is something that is really important and makes a difference and has an impact. Right. Because uh, because as you've noted, we're working on some really important problems in our other areas of work. Right. And so I think one of the things that's been exciting is that we have we have tried to engage everyone in this process. And part of that is as well, we did not restrict submissions to things we were not working on. So there are submissions that came related to climate. There are submissions I don't know if there was one related to nuclear. I'll have to, maybe there were two. I can't quite remember now. But we had submissions in a lot of spaces where we were already working in. Listen, if we could solve that for a hundred million. I know, I know. <laughs> um, and and we compiled those and presented those to our our staff in that area because it gave them an opportunity to see what else is out there that they might not have been aware of, to to help inform their work, to kind of keep it re-energizing. So we now recognize this is a, a great source of ideas. Mm -hmm. And not only for us, but for the field, the philanthropic field, mm -hmm. and which is why we're sharing them. <laughs> right. So can you talk a little bit about the four um, the four finalists, uh, who they are, and you know, what is it about them? Um, are there any things in common that have recommended them to this exalted final position, or um, is it is is there something about the variety of them? Um, yeah, a little bit of all. That? I mean, I think you know. First of all, we had eight strong. I, I last February I said to the eight semifinalists, each team we had come to the foundation. I said my job is to make the board's job really hard next fall. And I feel like that part of my job, I succeeded. I'm going to give myself a check mark on the mm -hmm. performance management review. Uh, we have eight very strong proposals. And, and ultimately, um, you know, what the board was looking at is a, a variety of things. And I think one of the probably bigger questions was the ways in which 100 million might be catalytic. Um, and the, and also kind of the fit of, whether MacArthur was particularly going to be helpful as a as a funder, so I think those were sorts of additional things that might have influenced uh, the discussion. The four finalists are um, the Sesame Workshop International Rescue Committee collaborative proposal, and that is going to do an early childhood development intervention with children in the Syrian refugee region, 
And here I think you have the, uh, you have a crisis. We have a crisis that's upon us. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of urgency to this particular problem. You have two organizations who have expertise that's needed to actually address it. Sesame has done culturally specific programming content in other places, Afghanistan and, and um, IRC is on the ground and, and in the camps. And the, so there's this combination of, there's a moment in time to act. And you have a generation of children who are being displaced, who've had their education disrupted. And there's an opportunity, if nothing else, to just alleviate some of the misery. <laughs> Mm -hmm. by providing options for the children and their families. And it's a combination of programming, but also, and I think this sometimes gets lost when it's covered, there are uh, child development centers being created uh, within uh, the camps and also home visitation programs mm -hmm. and, um, and other kinds of, in fact, ele electronic sort of supported, digitally supported um, support for families. The... Um, Second project is Catholic Relief Services and Lumos and Maestro. And you'll start to see a theme here. Almost all of the projects are collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, Catholic Relief Services, Maestro, and Lumos are um, working together to end the orphanages, basically. But they want to change the way we care for children who mm -hmm. are labeled as orphans, many of whom, 80% of whom, have a living parent. <laughs> and who would, would keep the child if they felt that the child had opportunities in either their community or their home, but because of poverty or lack of infrastructure, don't feel that they can, can care for it. And yet there's a lot of research out there that suggests that children do better in family-based care. And there's some evidence that, in fact, you could do family-based care for pretty much the same cost as institutional yeah, Right, right. So the idea here is that, that, that they are going to, they've identified seven countries that are interested in making the shift, and the goal is to help those seven countries make the shift from institutions to family-based and other kinds of, of community-based care, and that use those as kind of demonstrations to, to persuade the donor community, which funds a lot of the orphanages, to shift their funding to these alternative kinds mm -hmm. of approaches to support families as opposed to orphanages. And so it's a it's an exciting project. It's a paradigm shifting project. And um, and so I think it's you know it, it, it um, it's very compelling in that regard that you could have right. a big impact down the road. And it's an example of what I'll call the unlocking of philanthropic resources. Right? Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll unlock resources that'll help. The um, a third project is Harvest Plus, and um, Harvest Plus is actually a collaboration of, of research and agricultural research institutes in Africa, the uh, IFPRI, I always forget what that acronym stands for, but International Food Policy Research Institute, mm -hmm. I think that's it. And um, it is focused on addressing micronutrient deficiency, uh, which are things like vitamin A, iron, zinc, which are associated with many health issues, including stunting, night blindness, um, and can be addressed through a process called biofortification, mm -hmm. which uses natural plant breeding <coughs> techniques to breed crops that are rich in these iron, zinc, and A. And it, what it does is it uses, it looks at what are the crops that people eat. So it's focused on farming families, which ironically are the ones who usually have the most of this kind of malnutrition, and then takes those crops and develops breeds that are enriched mm -hmm. and introduces them into the existing kind of agricultural marketplace, where so far there's a lot of evidence they're being adopted, and they mm -hmm. have a marketing plan, an information plan. So the idea here is to scale up what has been a successful introduction in a few countries to more countries and more communities. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then, let's see, I've done the first three, that's always a test for myself. Can I pull them all out? <laughs> all right. Um, we have Rice University 360, which is actually a collaboration, Rice University, University of Malawi, Kellogg Business School, and a private uh, uh, organization called Third Stone, which has uh, been looking at premature birth in hospitals. And it started in Malawi. The project has really in initiated there where there's babies who would survive if the kinds of technologies that we think of as just commonplace in our hospitals were available. 
people have donated those technologies, but they don't work there because they are highly sensitive to things like power surges or power outages, and, and there's no way of repairing them when they break down. And so what they've been doing is working with engineering students, both at Rice and in Malawi, to develop adapted versions of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And they've created, identified a suite of technologies that they will either be working to develop or finding others, because there's others working in this space, and bringing those as part of the suite that they've called NEST. Right, And so the idea is to roll that out and to reduce infant mortality that's due to preterm birth through right. this process. Interesting. Um, so these are very different projects. Right. Am I, I, have I gotten? You got four. I got four. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You remembered every single one of them. Um, so let me ask you, that. Just uh, it be, uh, I'll ask you about just one of them. In this adaptive systems, the mm -hmm. adaptive versions of technology, of technology that would, in fact, save hundreds, thousands of lives of children, um, how does that become sustainable in that we know that over time those technologies will change a lot? Yes. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the context around within which those technologies are used will change. Mm -hmm. um, how is that sustain, uh, made sustainable? What is exciting about this project is that it's about more than developing the technologies. It's also creating capacity within the local communities to continue to innovate and adapt. Um, the and, and this is you know really I think a really important piece of the project that's hard to capture in the video that you watch. Mm -hmm. um, the excitement that's happening in terms of engineering education in Malawi that's also planned for the other places. They're first going to do some expansion into Tanzania um, and then into Nigeria where there's a more private-based system to test out can private work as mm -hmm. well as these public systems. And in each case there is a curriculum for the local engineering programs and the technician level programs to engage the students there in how do you do kind of human-centered design how do you understand what the needs are in the hospital and adapt and, and innovate in order to supply those? And at least one of the uh, instruments they developed was done in Malawi by Malawian students. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you create a, um, an ecosystem that will allow this to continue to happen. And there, it sounds like really tries to lift it up, lift it up as a discipline. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. And how about, for instance, with the um, Sesame Workshop? Um, how does that become sustainable? Well, this is, I think, different parts of it have different pieces. And yeah. One part, the programming has a kind of, you know, eternal quality. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who grew up on Big Bird will can turn it on now and get just to laugh and enjoy it the same right. way. And it might be exactly the same show that was, you know, when my kid was three. Um, so there's an eternal quality to the programming itself. There, there also has been a model that Sesame has of that the programming services and some of the licensing generates revenue that helps to continue their product development okay. and so on. I think there is a question about some of the on the ground, the uh, home visiting and the, uh, the direction, the creation of community centers, which will rely on continued flow of philanthropic support, right. but that's a flow that's coming in, you know, for the International Rescue Committee, and, and in a way what it's doing is making it more impactful. Right. By, by making these centers have a bigger impact on children's lives. Right. Yeah, um, it's interesting because that home-centered um, support has been acknowledged as the way to go for how many years? It's got to be 50, 50, um, 50 years now, right, or more. That's right, and, and this is an example of that, you know, we sort of suspected when we created 100 and Change that there were known solutions right. that, um, unfortunately, we sometimes, as a society, and, and not just, I'd say, the philanthropic community. We get excited by what's new and innovative and exciting and the next big thing. Right. And when sometimes the solution is sitting there. <laughs> right. And we just haven't I mean, taken it's, that. I mean, it's yeah. really kind of remarkable because I think that this has been resurfaced any number of times. Yes. And um, is is clearly, it's been well evaluated, mm -hmm. it's been well, you know, and, and, and it's shown up really well in its evaluations, and still 
it has not necessarily become the standard um, right. for the support of families who are have serious challenges. Yes, yes. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, it's disturbing. And so I, I wonder, is, is this an attempt to take um, an already existing theory um, and just make it so omnipresent or so kind of obvious and in your face that um, that it will change policy? Is that part of what is being thought about? You know, I think that is certainly an element. I don't know how much of that is an element of the, the Sesame IR Street per se, which is really is focused on uh, the refugee children. But certainly it's an element of the Catholic Relief Service Lumos Maestro. Right. And, and, and this is where these two kind of touch each other. Right. You know, in the sense of uh, they're both focused on children who are vulnerable and, um, and applying what is known about child development to help improve their status. And so whereas the, the other one is more explicitly focused on policy change, on, on mm -hmm. getting you know, governments to change what they, what, they, what, what they think the appropriate way of caring for uh, children without parents is. Right. Uh, and, and this other, it is changing kind of a, a different, it's an, in some ways, it, it also has to rely on some policy changes within the countries where they operate. Um, in, in Jordan, for example, which has been, I think, an important partner, in the Sesame IRC because they have a commitment to educating all children and mm -hmm. they have seen their population of school age children skyrocket mm -hmm. because of the refugee crisis. Right. And so yes, they're right there to try and, and help make this, this happen. It's interesting because it would seem like, uh, you know, as you go along, you may see additional opportunities for impact. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, and, and I think, you know, it, it's what we want to have happen. So our, our guideline is that we said, uh, we would take at least three years to pay out the 100 million, but you could ask for five to six, and most of these organizations have asked for five or six years. So the hope is that at the end of the five or six years, we can point to something, right. and that will, again, as you were saying, maybe demonstrate that look, this works. Like right. you can, you just just use the will, put the will, put the resources, and really focus and right. make it work. Right. So let's talk. I, I've been I've been trying to monitor the questions a little bit as they come in, and and please feel free, um, all of you out there, to um, log in your questions and comments now. But um, let me ask a couple of them that we've already gotten. And one is, and and this gets to the question of is this impactful beyond beyond the actual granting and the people that you've been in contact with mm -hmm. through the process. And um, so the question is, the first question, are these proposals available for review? The, there are executive summaries of the proposals available for review. And if you go to the competition website, 100 and, and it's andchange.org, um, you, you can go under the menu and it'll say explore all submissions. And we have short descriptions of the projects. We have their topics. You can search by geography. Um, and so I encourage you to go and, and to look at that. We are working on some slightly friendlier search functions um, that kind of do more of the work for you. Um, and pay attention because we'll be rolling some things out over the next couple of months to, to group them by a little more by using different taxonomies, sustainable development goals, and all of those sorts of things. If you are a funder, uh, and are interested in more detail on anything you've seen, please contact me, uh, cconrad at macfound.org, and we have a um, we have a wiki <laughs> that we can give you access to that gives you a bit more information about the proposals. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think that that what people do know with any of you big foundations <laughs> is that there is an element of influencing the field um, that comes out of these kinds of projects. Um, when you declare yourself in on a particular kind of initiative, it's likely to have some ripple effects in the rest of the foundation community, um, if it holds water at all. Yeah. And this one, and, and is intriguing, right? So um, I guess my question is, can you anticipate or do you yet know what kind of ripple effects this will have on the rest of the foundation community? Are people saying, oh, I like that, I want to do that in, in small form? How are, what are you hearing? Well, 
I do, I have heard about a couple of small farm imita imitators uh, that I've had conversations with how we structured this um, that are, are trying to use the open call competition mode as a way of expanding the, their network. Um, mm -hmm. Because these tend to be, you know, foundations tend to be very reliant on a network that they have, and and the network tends to be kind of, you know, snowball one contact to the other. And this is a way of making sure that there are people out there that you know about their work. And so, I, I've known of some small regional foundations that are doing something similar. We have had foundations reach out to us who just want to see what we got. Right. And that happened almost the moment we announced. I really? started getting yeah. calls uh, like. Are you really doing a completely open call? That's when I got called crazy. But since you are crazy, we've always wanted to know what we would get. So would you send us what we have in, in your field? So we've been doing curated lists for foundations of here's everything we got in the area of your work. And um, and that I, I'm hoping it's, it's hard to track the outcomes of these things because some of them may take a time to, to ferment uh, for mm -hmm. engagements to happen. Um, but that's another area that I think we've, we've gotten some interest on. I, I think there is a space that I am, um, that we're, we're trying to think about how to engage with of newer philanthropists who don't have maybe even formal foundations mm -hmm. or family funds who, who have a desire to do something but don't know where to begin. And so this is another place where we've gotten some interest. Mm -hmm. Like this is a database. These are ideas that you have, particularly among our eight finalists and some eight semi-finalists. These are ideas you've vetted. Mm -hmm. um, these are ideas that, that you know, if it appeals to us, we'd be interested maybe in exploring more how to how to leverage the fact that you've done this. So I'm I think I believe I'm seeing some effects, but it's all now still speculative and. And it makes me a little nervous because I want such wonderful things to happen. <laughs> no, um, but but you know, people have for years been um, complaining about the fact that some foundations treat those grant applications as if they're super secret documents, mm -hmm. and um, that it really doesn't necessarily move out and help to increase the knowledge, the wisdom, the curiosity of the field. And so the fact that you're offering Mm -hmm. to curate, the, not not just to make the material available, but to curate that material that you're making available, I think is a major step forward. And that people, that other foundations are coming to you is a nice, you know, that that is some payback, perhaps, yes, for yeah. some of the organizations I hope that applied. So. Yeah. yeah. I hope some of them have had phone calls. I, I mean, I know of a few places that have had some uh, side, some side benefits. A charity Navigator this summer. Um, did you know about this? The Charity mm -hmm. Navigator? They, they had identified among our top 200, 40 organizations that they had already rated in their rating system. Mm -hmm. And so they did profiles of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they saw some increase in, you know, the donate button. Um, I'm not sure the organizations have any yeah. way of knowing whether it had to do with there being an 100 and change or not, but, but I think of that as a, a side kind of benefit. Right. Well, we have a, a bunch of people who have asked the same thing, so I'm going to ask this question um, now, which is, was this your one and only? Mm -hmm. Um, what are you going to do from here on in? And and I do want to say, just answering this first question for you, the grant process is closed. The application process for, the first for round. this round is closed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, don't worry about having to mobilize quickly, but can you talk about how you're intending to go forward, what your decision points are? Yes. So we anticipate um, repeating a version of this in um, – well, let me put it this way. We anticipate putting out another big grant of this type potentially in three years. We hope to announce midsummer. So we've we've been doing evaluation and learning. We're going to be collecting everything we've learned. We will tweak what this is, and um, by midsummer, hope to announce what the next thing will look like. The a couple things I'll say is that one is that I, one of the things I think I've learned, and I'm. I'm jumping ahead of the evidence being presented in front of me, but I mentioned earlier that we would want a longer launch pad. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, we'll announce something midsummer, but it'll be a while um, before the deadline will emerge. So um, I should have more details by midsummer. That's my goal. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think that um, we're just about 
through our questions. And this has been really incredibly wonderful. There's one other question that people do have, and I, I'll answer this a little bit, so I'll just replace you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is, are you going to do any publishing? Um, about this effort. And I will say we do already have a nice article from Cecilia about uh, about how they went about the process and what it looked like inside of this process. And um, that's on our website at Nonprofit Quarterly. But are you planning other kinds of publishing to move out of this? And how are we going to, how, how are you going to share this information? Well, um, yes. And so the, first of all, you'll note if you read the piece in Nonprofit Quarterly that I suggest some research questions that we're interested in. If there are researchers out there in the community, we're interested. Our data is available. We can help you know, make that available, and it's a very rich uh, database. Uh, we will, at a minimum, we have a practice in the foundation of once we have evaluation reports of making um, at least the executive summaries of those public, and I anticipate that we will be yeah. doing that. That's a little ways out in the horizon. I've had lots of people say, you know, you got to write the story. And we've been carefully documenting and collecting pieces in history. So I anticipate that we will try and tell the story in a full way once right. we've had a chance to kind of step back and take a deep breath and, and look at it Warts again. and all. <laughs> yes, <laughs> warts and all. Because <laughs> right. if you don't talk about the warts, you know, your stories yeah. are not no, you, you, that exciting. It, it's a... Uh, one of the things that I think it's important for me about this process, and, and certainly I think as I've worked with staff at, at MacArthur and as I've talked to others, is that that sometimes you just you know that it's you don't you don't have to study something forever before you try to do it because you're gonna there are things you just will not learn until you start through the process. Right. And you try to take steps to kind of mitigate, make sure you don't make giant unrecoverable mistakes, but. Um, you recognize along the way, oh, we probably won't do it that way again. We right. have a we have a spreadsheet that I think is multiple pages now <laughs> of things not to do again. <laughs> right. And uh, th I think that's a part of this this initiative that um, is a is as exciting for me is that we're going to learn and that we'll share what we've learned. Right. Right. So there was one more question that I thought might be interesting to close with, and that is um, there are a couple of people on uh, who have written in and asked, um, so, do you, you know, do you need to be a big collaborative to end up with this money? Is there any chance reasonably that a small community-based organization could um, make a persuasive case for a change? Um, and can you talk about what might be some of the barriers to that? And we were talking about yes. this a little bit earlier. And what people need to think about when they're thinking about should I, shouldn't I, um, what are my considerations? Right. Um, and I, I think there are a number of things because I, I, I mentioned earlier that the small community-based kind of organizations or local, even just local collaboratives in some cases, didn't fare as well in the judging process. Right. And, and I think there were multiple factors involved with that. One is something that we're paying a lot of attention to, and that is working a little harder to communicate to judges that meaningful doesn't have to mean large numbers. That meaningful could mean that, you know, it's a smaller number of people, but you have a really big impact. But you can understand that that will always be something that is a subjective aspect to this. And, and um, I, did, I just want to make sure that we are make it clear to judges that we're open to that. Um, I think the other issue is, again, this is where it comes back to Launchpad. A lot of small organizations um, aren't don't have like an infrastructure. They don't have staffs of grant writers. They don't have um, the kinds of things that some larger larger organizations do. That means that from June to October, they could really come up with a really compelling application. Right. And so, launch lengthening the Launchpad, thinking out different ways we might offer workshops and other support to make that possible for some of these smaller things. Yeah, organizations is another piece. And then I think it's important to take a look at your own capacity. $100 million is a lot of money to absorb. And that's something we're going to be paying attention to. And thinking about whether or not scaling has to mean that you try to get bigger. Or can scaling mean that you take on 
partnerships or that you franchise an idea, that you find other organizations in other communities who could benefit from the project that you have successfully shown works in your community and get them on board as partners. I, I said that it, it's interesting that many of the ones that ended up as our top our four are collaborations and mm -hmm. because that's one way of scaling. And right. I think that's another message that I would encourage community organizations, local groups to think about. The last little piece, and, and I'll, I'll put in here, and this is just something I've been toiling with as I've looked at applications and thought through the process. Um, colleges and universities that represented a fairly significant number of the total applicant pool. There's just one of them in the in the top mm -hmm. four, and there, and, and this is where. I